Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll just give everybody a few more minutes to get logged in, and then we will start the presentation. Hi, everyone, again, thanks for joining us. We'll just give everybody a couple more minutes here and then we will start the presentation. Okay, well, we'll get this uh, show started. I know Coral's anxious to tell everybody about one of her favorite Westworld tours and her favorite destinations, but um, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Cindy Erickson, tour coordinator with Westworld Tours, and I'll be facilitating the, the presentation this evening and joining me to tell you all about the great sites and attractions you'll experience on our journey to Alaska is our senior tour director, Coral Romanchuk. Welcome, Coral. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you this evening. And as Cindy said, a pleasure to be talking about one of my favorite tours. So before I turn the presentation over to Coral, I do have a couple of things I would like to mention. Our future presentations is uh, next week, we're going to have a presentation on Iceland, which is again, November 29th at seven o'clock p.m. And that is going to be our final um, virtual presentation for 2023. But make sure you stay tuned for our um, 2024 presentation series. We're going to take a little break now until after the new year. So if you would like to receive invites to future presentations, as well as timely information on any of our new tours, we recommend that you follow us on Facebook and sign up to receive our email newsletter. We won't inundate you with emails and you can unsubscribe at any time. So you can um, you know, email us or actually visit our website at westworldtours.com slash subscribe. And uh, you can uh, send us a quick email and you can sign up for our email newsletter there. I'm gonna launch a quick poll on the screen here and uh, it'll also give you a chance here to sign up for our email newsletter if you like. You can sign up for the Westworld Tours strictly. You can sign up for Women Explorers Tours and you can uh, sign up for both. And if you're already receiving them, you can let us know that as well. So I'll give everybody a chance to uh, make a selection there. And if you joined us on Facebook, I'm sorry, the poll will not pop up on your screen. But you can go to our website, like I said, westworldtours.com slash subscribe, and you can uh, sign up for the newsletter there. So thank you, everyone, for, for letting us know on that. This is a little preview here of our tour for our presentation for next week, which is our Golden Circle Tour of Iceland. And uh, Iceland is definitely one of those bucket lift destinations unlike any other. And Leanne will be joining us next week and she can tell you all about our Westworld Tours um, and her last trip with Westworld Tours group to Iceland and uh, the land of fire and ice. We're going to be going in July 22nd and returning July 31st. It's a 10 day tour. We are one of the only companies out there that does do a full circle tour of Iceland. Um, so you really get a, a really um, in-depth overview of the country when you're there. It does include 20 meals. It's an excellent tour. And so hopefully you can join us next week as we tell you more about that particular trip. Questions. Uh, we do encourage you to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation. Please just put them in the, um, type them into the Q&A box. It's located there on your screen. And if you've joined us on Facebook, you can type your questions in there as well. And we will get to all of them at the end of our presentation. 
And again, type them into that Q&A box as, you, as we go through the presentation. Um, that way, as Coral moves through, you know, you may forget the what she was talking about, but if you, you know, enter it right away, then, then we'll get to you for sure. So a little bit about us. Um, Western, Westworld Tours is uh, Western Canada's premier motor coach tour company. And we've been serving Canadians from coast to coast with escorted travel throughout North America and around the world since the year 2000. Uh, we offer quality components to all our tours, including modern comfortable coaches, professional tour directors like Coral, um, experienced courteous drivers, baggage handling, and excellent accommodations. Uh, our tours always include all the sites and attractions important to our guests, and we also provide uh, several meals throughout our tours. So Alaska and the Yukon, we're talking to you about three of our tours to Alaska, the three different ways that we, we tour Alaska for the summer of 2024 where you're gonna, you can immerse yourself in the serenity of the rugged landscape and stunning scenery of Alaska and the Yukon. Um, you'll discover the history of one of the world's most famous highways. You'll vi visit uh, famous gold rush towns, uh, see wildlife, glaciers, ice cap mountains, and so much more. Um, our tours to Alaska and the Yukon are all scheduled for the summer of uh, 2024. And uh, again, Coral will go over these tours and the tour dates with you. Actually, I'll review the tour dates with you on our next slide. So as I mentioned, we do um, have three ways for you to discover Alaska. We have an Alaska All Coach Tour, which departs June 6th to the 25th. We have our Alaska Cruise Tour, which goes June 9th to the 28th. And we have um, our Taste of Alaska. For those that are looking for something a little bit um, shorter, we have uh, the Taste of Alaska, which goes from June 9th to 21st. I should mention that our all coach tour is um, your coaching from Regina or Saskatchewan all the way up into Alaska. And you'll be returning by coach again back to Saskatchewan. On the cruise tour, again, you'll start your journey in Saskatchewan and travel up via coach into Alaska and sail home, pardon me, not sail home to Saskatchewan. That would be a little difficult. Uh, sail from Anchorage or the port of Anchorage and seaward back to Vancouver and then fly home from Vancouver. And our taste of Alaska shortens things up for you if you don't have a lot of time. Uh, again, you can coach all the way up into Alaska and at the end of the tour, concluding in Anchorage and board your flight and come home. So those are the three different tours that we do offer into Alaska. So at this point, I am going to turn the presentation over to Coral. She'll tell you all the good stuff. Um, Coral is our, as I mentioned, our senior tour director, and she has been with us now for over 20 years. She's traveled the globe extensively. She's stepped foot on all seven continents, and she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to her role guiding our guests around the world. And we are pleased that she's here to join us this evening. So again, welcome, Coral, and uh, I can't wait to hear your presentation on Alaska myself. Mm, thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, it's hard to believe it's uh, been this many years. I've uh, I've been with Westworld since 2001, but uh, definitely goes to show you how much I enjoy working uh, for our company that I've uh, been with it for such a long time and uh, met so many lovely people, just so many lovely people and so many incredible memories of uh, of all these years and uh, there is no question in my mind that one of my absolute most favorite tours to guide for Westworld is the one we're talking about tonight so it's truly a pleasure to be here with you all everybody and uh, a pleasure to be presenting on one of my favorite tours tonight. 
All right. Well, we might as well go ahead and uh, and get started. So uh, this screen here uh, is a bit of a rundown of uh, the various attractions that uh, that we'll be seeing on uh, on the tour. Um, I'm not going to bother reading them all to you right now because we're going to go through all these things uh, basically almost one by one <laughs> as uh, we go through our time together tonight. Uh, but I'll also uh, break down not just a bit about the attractions we do, but I'll break down for you a little bit about the uh, the different itineraries uh, that we do as well. So sounds great. Uh, we can carry on to the next slide, Cindy. Uh, as Cindy was saying, I, we do have the uh, all coach tour uh, for Westworld. And I just want to say everyone, as I start my time with you tonight, uh, June is really an ideal time to do the tour to the Yukon in Alaska, whether you are doing the all coach, the taste of, or the coach and cruise. Uh, the reasons I would say that we usually get a lot of really beautiful weather uh, in June. Um, I've done this tour a lot of times and sure there are years when we've had a little more rain than, than other years but usually we're blessed with uh, lots of sunshine in June and really nice temperatures. I would say our averages on this tour are usually maybe low 20s, like around, you know, 21, 22, 23 Celsius. So just really pleasant temperatures. Um, I've done uh, all of my tours to the Yukon and Alaska in June. I've never been up there in mid-July. I've heard the bugs get a lot worse in the summertime, which I would believe. Usually the insects, the mosquitoes and so on are not that bad in June. And if there was one more really fantastic reason to do this tour in the month of June, it's to actually be in the land of the midnight sun and experiencing the sun never setting is just such an incredible thing. So there are so many, uh, incredible things about the tour. We're going to dive into just a little bit of history tonight. Those of you who are history lovers, let me tell you, this tour is right up your alley. And the scenery, I have so many times said to people, uh, you just feel like every day the scenery can't get more and more beautiful. And every day it does. It just gets more and more beautiful for day after day. So just so many reasons why this is one of my favorite tours personally. Thanks, Cindy. We're going to take it from the top though so as i say uh we're going to start by running through the all coach tour everybody and uh then we'll break down uh you know where the itineraries branch off and uh and how that works but uh um you know it's it's really just uh, the best of everything uh going up uh, the alaska highway so uh, we make our way uh, up to edmonton and then from edmonton the following day we make our way through grand prairie and up to mile zero of the alaska highway so the shots you're looking at here are photos taken in Dawson Creek, BC. And uh, yeah, I know for many people getting to the Yukon and Alaska really is a bucket list trip. And I promise you, you won't be disappointed <laughs> with it. This is mile zero of the Alaska Highway. And as I was saying, history, it's just profound here. It really is. Uh, when you consider that the Alaska Highway was built in a period of under nine months and uh, 1,422 miles all told. So so it was an incredible engineering marvel. Um, an alternate name for the Alaska Highway, you sometimes hear the Alcan Highway, uh, referring to Alaska and Canada, so the Alaska-Canada Highway. But uh, uh, much of the construction work was done by the U.S. Army uh, Corps uh, of Engineers. Canada provided the right of way for the highway to be built. Uh, the highway actually has uh, shortened uh, over the years, so it's actually not technically uh, 1,400 22 miles now because of various rerouting projects that have gone over the years and made it into a very modern highway. At one time, it was a pretty rough, rugged road, but nowadays it is very much motor coach worthy. And uh, where we might see some construction along the highway, it's uh, it's actually pretty good. It is. Uh, so it might have been constructed in 1942. That's true. But it didn't actually open to the public until the year 1948, five years later. Uh, Milepost zero uh, is uh, what you're seeing in the center of the screen and also up there in the top left hand corner. So uh, that mile marker was typical of what the original mile markers would have looked like. Now, even still today, some of the communities along the Alaska Highway uh, still, you know, think of themselves or consider themselves by their original mile marker. Probably one of the, the most fun ones was a place called Wanawan in uh, northern BC. 
on the Alaska Highway, it was mile 101. So 101 or 101. So that's how uh, that's how 101 got its name. But uh, um, we make a little stop at uh, Dawson Creek by mile zero. And then if you look down in the bottom lower hand corner of the screen, that is the alternate uh, Alaska Highway uh, sign. And that's actually where we do our group picture. I think pretty well all of us as guides uh, line our folks up for a group picture under the mile zero sign. Uh, the top left hand corner, though, that original marker is in the middle of the street. It's not the safest place to have your picture taken. So luckily they put another sign next to the visitor center and that's the visitor center on the right hand side of the screen. And the old elevator you see below it was actually converted into an art gallery. So usually when we're there, the art gallery is open as well. And we have a little stroll around town, have a lovely welcome uh, by the staff in the visitor center. And it's really an exciting uh, day on our tour beginning, uh, officially beginning the, uh, the Alaska Highway. Thanks, Cindy. <clears throat> hmm. All right, uh, I love this stop uh, on the Alaska Highway. This is Fort Nelson. So we journey up through Fort St. Uh, John and then we make our way to Fort Nelson. And by the time we get there, we're still in Northern British Columbia, but you're just starting to really feel, you know, like the, the scenery is changing. Uh, it's so spectacular. You're getting that very remote uh, feeling. Uh, if you see the number 300 ab above the museum sign, the top left-hand corner, uh, Fort Nelson is one of those places is that traditionally refers to itself by its original mile marker and that was uh, mile 300 so uh, so yeah uh, Fort Nelson was the first first established as a fur trading post uh, back in 1805 but uh, we overnight there and uh, we have a couple of really fun stops. I love the Fort Nelson Heritage Museum. Uh, there's so much to see there and so much of, uh, of what we see and the fact that it exists today uh, was a result of the first curator of the museum. And uh, I always feel like I would be remiss doing a presentation on this tour without mentioning his name. Uh, his name was Marl Brown and he just passed away in 2021. So many of our West World groups had the pleasure of meeting him, but uh, he first came up the highway back in 1957 he was a mechanic and saw all the basically the the vehicles uh you know remnants artifacts and such from the Alaska Highway and the construction of it kind of being just tossed aside and garbaged and so he started saving things until finally in the 1970s he had so much stuff accumulated that uh, he opened the Fort Nelson Heritage Museum and was the first curator uh he looked like Santa Claus only uh only a really really skinny uh Santa Claus and he was just a, a lovely human being. So uh, you see the vehicles in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Uh, I heard it said, and I genuinely believe it was true, there wasn't one vehicle in that big Quonset hut that Marl couldn't get started. So uh, yeah, uh, but uh, for the guys and maybe for the ladies too, you'll find all those old pieces of machinery so interesting. And uh, just so many interesting things in the museum, even a couple of really random things like an albino cow, cow moose stuffed and mounted in the museum and an old silver tea set mysteriously found at the bottom of someone's well outside of Fort Nelson. So uh, we tour there and then you're seeing another shot in the top right hand corner and the bottom left hand corner of the Fort Nelson Visitor Center. We have a really lovely uh, presentation there, uh, very warm and welcoming. The staff at the, the local VC, they do a little presentation for us and beautiful little shop as you can see in the top right hand corner where local artists <clears throat> excuse me pardon me where um, local artists and artisans have the opportunity to sell, sell their wares so that is uh, Fort Nelson and then we carry on up the Alaska Highway. <laughs> Thanks Cindy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the following day after we leave Fort Nelson, uh, we make our way uh, finally into the Yukon Territory. But uh, before we do that, the scenery, it's just, it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite days uh, for scenery on this tour. Uh, we uh, we travel through uh, over Steamboat Mountain and um, yeah, and through uh, Stone Mountain uh, Provincial Park. Uh, a stop we make at lunchtime, we actually do a picnic and uh, give our group a chance to uh, just to enjoy a dip in beautiful Liard Hot Springs. So uh, what you're looking at in the top left hand corner, the entrance up to the hot springs itself, and then a beautiful shot Cindy has for us on the lower right hand side of your screen of, uh, of Liard Hot Springs. 
hot springs. So it's actually a natural hot spring. I think you can tell that in the picture. It's not a, you know, a cement concrete uh, hot spring. You're literally floating in the water with, uh, you know, kind of a dirt bottom and plants kind of just you know, falling into the water at the edges. And uh, it's just so beautiful. It's really lovely. So we do that. And then we continue on up the highway, crossing the border that day into the, into the Yukon territory. Uh, so Yukon uh, first named, uh, the river was named Yukon for Yukana, meaning the Great, Great River. And then the territory uh, took the same name as well. But we do have a, a one night stay in Watson Lake, Yukon. And this is the home of one of the truly iconic places on the Alaska Highway. And uh, it happens early on in our trip. This is a signpost forest, everybody. And uh, there's a great shot in the lower left hand corner of the screen and a great shot of the entrance to it on the top right hand corner. It's kind of a heartwarming story. <clears throat> And the story goes, one of those American soldiers back in 1942, his name was Carl Lindley. He was from Danville, Illinois. Uh, he had some sort of injury. I have, over the years, I have never heard what his injury was, but uh, he was assigned light duty while he was recovering from his injury. And uh, some of that light duty involved doing sign repair. So being a homesick soldier far from, uh, far from his homeland, uh, he decided to make his own sign. And uh, the sign said, Carl Lindley, Danville, Illinois, uh, 2,835 miles. And that's how far it was to home. Well, sometimes things just catch on. And that was one of those things. And today it's estimated that there are nearly 100,000 signs in the signpost forest. Every year they're inventoried. Any signs that are no longer legible are taken down. But any signs that are legible are left up for as many years as, uh, as they're readable. And you see everything. You see fancy signs. People have taken a lot of time to, uh, you know, make an effort to take on their vacation up the Alaska Highway. Sometimes you see a cookie sheet that someone, uh, you know, pounded, uh, you know, pounded into basically just to grab something quickly out of their RV uh, on their way up the Alaska Highway and put their name on a cookie sheet and put it up uh, license place. You see everything. And of course, with Westworld, we're really pleased that we always do a group sign that everyone gets to sign. And uh, then we lacquer it and put it up in, uh, in the forest. And sometimes uh, our passengers bring their own signs from home. And we just have so much fun uh, in the signpost forest. Thanks, Cindy. There's just so many things to talk about uh, with this tour. It's uh, it's hard to be brief, so <laughs> I'll do my best to, to not take too long, everyone. But uh, uh, what you're seeing here is just as we're entering the city of Whitehorse, and uh, Whitehorse has been the capital of the Yukon Territory since 1953. Uh, the original capital was Dawson City, and uh, we're going to talk about Dawson City, Yukon pretty soon. Uh, it was the capital uh, from 1898 at the height of the gold rush, and 10 1953, uh, but population of Whitehorse had increased so drastically that it became the territorial capital, uh, much to Dawson City's great disappointment. And uh, so today, uh, Whitehorse is the capital of the territory with about 25,000 people. So still a relatively small population, but it is a beautiful little, little city and uh, named for the, uh, the Whitehorse Rapids. Uh, what you're looking at here is an absolutely beautiful uh, photo stop that we make with all of our Westworld groups. You see that stunning turquoise water of Miles Canyon on the Yukon River. And uh, it's possible some of you listening here tonight might recognize the words, there's a land where the mountains are nameless and the rivers all run God knows where. There are lives that are erring and aimless and deaths that just hang by a hair. There are hardships that nobody reckons. There are valleys unpeopled and still. There's a land, oh, it beckons and beckons and I want to go back and I will. It's the great big broad land way up yonder. It's the forest where silence has lease. It's the beauty that thrills me with wonder. It's the stillness that fills me with peace. And Miles Canyon was actually one of the places that inspired those words uh, by a very famous poet named Robert Service, uh, who became uh, very famous for the poetry that he wrote during his time uh, living in the Yukon Territory in uh, Whitehorse and in Dawson City. So uh, Miles Canyon was one of his great sources of inspiration uh, when he lived uh, in Whitehorse and uh, worked for the Bank of Commerce there. Uh, what you're seeing is the suspension bridge in the top left hand corner 
over uh, the narrowest part of, uh, of Miles Canyon. Uh, it's an 85 foot long suspension bridge. And we do a photo stop here. And then we do a photo stop looking down from the top of the cliffs down on Miles Canyon. So just a beautiful spot. Thanks, Cindy. And at this point in the tour, uh, we have uh, a stay in uh, in Whitehorse. It is, as I was saying, a really lovely little city uh, surrounded with just incredible scenery uh, built on the banks of the Yukon River and sitting on the banks of the Yukon River is one of the old uh, steam wheeler uh, ships. Uh, the, the Kino is in Dawson uh, City. Uh, the Tushai, which uh, sadly burned, uh, is the frame of it at least, is still sitting in Carcross Yukon. Uh, but the Klondike is the one that we have an opportunity to actually tour uh, with our Westworld groups. And the SS Klondike was in service. This was a second one. Uh, there was one before it uh, that eventually sunk. Uh, but this one that you can see in all three of these photos here was in service from 1937 until 1955. And it plied the waters of the Yukon River, carrying mail, uh, various goods, freight, people <laughs> as well too, up and down uh, the Yukon River. Finally, uh, when the SS Klondike and the other paddle wheelers were rendered obsolete was when the highway was completed, uh, what today we call the North Klondike Highway from Whitehorse up to Dawson City. Uh, but the SS Klondike is incredibly interesting to tour. It's actually uh, operated and managed now by, uh, by Parks Canada. And uh, so yeah, decommissioned and now it's a Canadian National Historic Site. So it's a very interesting tour we have with, uh, with the Parks Canada staff there. Thanks, Cindy. <clears throat> And now we get into what is not only one of my favorite places on this entire tour, it is unquestionably one of my favorite places in Canada. Uh, if I had to list my top three favorite places in our beautiful country, there is absolutely no question in my mind whatsoever that Dawson City, Yukon uh, would easily make that list. Uh, as we journey up the North Klondike Highway, uh, going from Whitehorse up to Dawson, it always seems to me that it feels with uh, every turn of the wheel of our motor coach it just feels like we're stepping back in time uh, with every mile until we get to Dawson City and it really feels so authentically to me like stepping back to the year 1898 so the history uh, the scenery the wildlife on this tour there's just so much but the history here for those of you listening tonight who are like me and you find history so interesting there's just so much there's a history that we talk about earlier in the trip about the construction construction of the Alaska Highway. But once we get up to Dawson City, now we're talking about something else. Now we're diving into the history of the Klondike Gold Rush. Well, the date was August 16th and the year was 1896 when three sourdoughs named Skookum Jim, Tagish Charlie, and George Carmack discovered gold on a tributary of the Yukon River. It was called Rabbit Creek. Rabbit Creek later became known as Bonanza Creek. And when we're Word got out of their discovery uh, of gold on Rabbit Creek. It set off one of the most famous gold rushes probably in, in history ever, uh, the Klondike Gold Rush. There was a lady behind the scenes too, and her name doesn't get mentioned as often as it should. And her name was Kate Carmack. She was George, Cl uh, George Carmack's indigenous wife. And uh, she was definitely one of the people who was very much involved in, uh, in what happened that day. Uh, history is really people stories and uh, there are just so many stories uh up here and uh you know and so many of those are just really you know people's experiences of what happened to them uh if you don't know that word sourdough or chichaco those are words that you certainly will learn uh on this tour uh but uh we have a, a really interesting uh city and area tour of dawson city uh we visit discovery claim which is actually that spot or more or less we believe that spot on uh, originally rabbit Creek, Bonanza Creek today, uh, where the uh, where the gold was actually discovered there. Uh, two other things you're seeing on the screen here, the lower right hand corner, one of the really special things we do in Dawson City. Uh, this is just such a, a lovely magical experience. There's a mountaintop outside of town. It's about a 15, maybe 20 minute drive maximum uh, from the center of town called the Dome. Uh, what you're looking at in the bottom right hand corner is just a beautiful car 
carved wooden bench. You sit on that bench or you stand on that mountaintop and you have the most unbelievably commanding view from up there. It is absolute magic. Uh, overlooking where the Yukon River and Klondike River converge. Looking down towards Dawson City. Looking down towards the gold tailings left behind from the gold dredges. And looking at two mountain ranges, the Richardson and Ogilvy ranges. And not only that, we take our group up there and we do a champagne toast uh, to toast the land of the midnight sun. And it is pure magic. It really is. And one of the special places we also visit that's included uh, for our groups during our time in uh, Dawson City uh, is Diamond Tooth Gerties, uh, one of the many uh, famous buildings in Dawson. And uh, that's what you're looking at on the left hand side uh, of your screen. Uh, it's so much fun to go and see those can-can uh, dancers there. Uh, looks like a couple of uh, hapless men uh, standing behind them who unfortunately didn't know and sat too close to the stage. You got to be careful, guys, uh, sitting in the front rows of the audience or you too uh, may end up on stage. Or maybe that's not a bad thing uh, with those uh, those lovely can-can girls. Diamond Tooth Gertie, uh, Gerties was named for the Diamond Tooth Gertie. Uh, she was one of the famous dance hall queens and uh, she was known uh, for the fact that for many years she wore a diamond between her two front teeth. That was her claim to fame. So uh, hence Diamond Tooth Gerties. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. <clears throat> well, as I was saying, um, Dawson City uh, really is like stepping back in time. And you can see that uh, with all of these, uh, these buildings here. Um, so some of the buildings are originals. Uh, if you have a look uh, in uh, on the lower part of the screen, uh, those are buildings that are very much preserved uh, by Parks Canada. In fact, there are uh, more than uh, 17 different historical buildings uh, that are protected by Parks Canada uh, in Dawson City. And in fact, uh, much of the downtown area is considered a Canadian National Historic Site. So what you're seeing in the bottom bottom uh, half of your screen. Cindy found some great pictures for us there. Um, and uh, let's start with the right hand side first. Uh, that's the Palace Grand Theatre over on the right, going towards the center of the screen, two very famous buildings uh, from the gold rush called the Leaning Sisters. You see how those two buildings just lean into each other. Uh, well, there was a time when uh, folks building, uh, you know, doing the construction in Dawson City didn't know how tricky it was to build on top of permafrost. And Dawson Dawson City is built on top of permafrost, and uh, that's why the Leaning Sisters look the way they do. Uh, same thing with the guns and ammunition shop. You can't really see uh, super well in that picture, but the bottom left-hand corner of the screen is another one of the original buildings uh, still, still left behind. So these are Parks Canada protected now, the old guns and ammo shop, uh, which in itself is on a pretty bad lean. I think it's got some boards propping it up now. But And if you look at the top of your screen, uh, you can see something else really interesting everybody and that is the fact that Dawson City has very specific building code restrictions you cannot build anything that looks modern in Dawson City everything has to be in keeping with the 1898 uh, theme and that's why even you know in 2023 uh, the town still looks uh, so 1898 that's actually the grocery store that you're looking at in the top left hand corner and the dark red building that's our hotel that's a lot of fun that's uh, the downtown hotel uh, uh, you can see the saloon doors uh, in the center uh, of the uh, the building there. Um, that is uh, where the famous uh, sour toe cocktail is served. Uh, one of the strangest and most unusual specialty drinks uh, in the world. So uh, yeah, home of the sour toe cocktail. As I say, there's just so much I could uh, I could tell you, but uh, I'll try and not tell you everything for the sake of time and for the sake of leaving some things to surprise as well too. Uh, something else that we have included for you uh, in our stay in Dawson City, we have a two night stay there. So besides uh, going up to the dome and having that champagne toast for anyone who wants to do that, uh, going to Diamond Tooth Gerties, uh, having this awesome town and area tour of Dawson, we also have included for you the Dawson City Museum. And, uh, and that's what you're looking at uh, in the top uh, 
let's see, it looks like uh, top uh, top left uh, and uh, and center as well, and then the uh, the bottom uh, left hand corner of your screen as well. And then the other three slides that you're looking at, uh, lower center and to the right hand side, everybody, uh, this is something else that I'm really pleased that we have a chance to tour uh, with Westworld. And uh, you will find this utterly fascinating. Gentlemen, you will for sure. Ladies, you'll probably just find it just as interesting as the guys do. Uh, but uh, this is also one of the Parks Canada uh, historic sites in Dawson City. What you're looking at, and from the outside uh, of it, you can see in the center lower of your screen, uh, Gold Dredge number four. And Gold Dredge number four was the largest, the world's largest wooden hauled bucket line uh, sluice dredge, which mine placer gold on the Klondike uh, or on the uh, uh, on the, the Yukon River, excuse me. Uh, so you had, you know, guys who were panning for gold and women, no doubt, too, panning for gold. Uh, well, there was a man named Klondike Joe Boyle, and he was the one that invented or came up with the concept of creating gold dredges that could take just a, such a tremendous amount of gold out of the river. Uh, he became uh, one of the icons uh, of the uh, of the gold rush, uh, Pierre Burton actually, and uh, one of his books tells a story about uh, about uh, Klondike Joe Boyle. But really fascinating gentleman. He did very very well, and uh, yeah, uh, because of him, these gold dredges existed. But gold dredge number four is a fascinating tour. You can see that you know our folks uh, folks walking through it on uh, the right hand side of the screen. It was like a house moving down the river. They were just huge, and they say that back in Dawson. City, you could hear the gold rush uh, working. So no doubt it uh, caused, uh, you know, many, uh, many a man, unfortunately, to, uh, you know, to go deaf uh, with the work uh, that was taking place there. But the gold dredges no longer operate. The gold tailings are left behind, which kind of look like giant caterpillars of uh, rock and sediment uh, that they left behind. And those in themselves, those gold tailings are considered, uh, you know, a historical part of Dawson City today. So just an absolutely fascinating place. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. Um, and now we say uh, farewell to the Yukon and hello to the next part of our tour. And uh, what you're seeing here, everyone, is uh, in the top left-hand corner, uh, one of the most spectacular highways uh, that I've ever been on. It's called the Top of the World Highway. Uh, it is a seasonal highway, uh, so it's closed in the winter time. But this is the highway we take when we leave Dawson City, Yukon, uh, making our way into Alaska or Alieska, uh, as it was originally known, the Great Land. And let me tell you, it's called the Great Land for a reason. It really is. And not only that, the top of the world highway is very, very appropriately named. There are so many stretches on that highway where in, in both sides, you look to your left, you look to your right out the motor coach windows, you are looking way, way down below at the scenery and you truly feel like you're the top of the world. It's spectacular. Um, of course, uh, you know, uh, the opportunity to take a take a photo of everybody next to the welcome to Alaska sign there. Uh, Cindy actually has a really nice shot of the uh, of the sign at the top of the world highway uh, there on the right hand side of the screen. And on the lower left hand side, uh, other than maybe a picture stop or two, and of course, customs uh, at the border, uh, the first stop that we make uh, leaving Dawson City that day is a place that I know Cindy has told me uh, she's really fascinated with. And uh, I don't blame her. It's one of my favorite places as well. And it is called Chicken Alaska. Uh, so you're looking at the sign and one of the chicken statues on the bottom uh, left hand side and uh, we like to take our groups right to beautiful downtown chicken alaska so we take you uh, right to the uh, chicken emporium uh, for some fun shopping incredible food uh, the bakery there by uh, a lady i've come to know and love uh, over my many years guiding uh, in alaska susan uh, just the most epic food uh, uh, you can imagine so we're ready for a coffee and homemade cookies and such maybe a piece of morning pie by the time we get to uh, to chicken um yeah uh, i know cindy was telling me she's uh, reading a fantastic book on alaska right now uh, those of you who are book lovers oh that's something i think probably all of us as guides love to do on our tours tell you about the great books you can uh, you can buy up there but uh, tisha written by ann purdy uh actually is a story and a book that originates from chicken alaska the story of uh, of a young teacher uh working in alaska who fell in love with a local and cindy i know that's something 
you could speak to better than me. But uh, uh, one little fun story uh, that's always fun to share with everybody about Chicken Alaska is uh, when the community was first settled, the original residents, the pioneers who settled there, in fact, had no plans to call the community chicken. What they had actually planned to name it was they wanted to name it for the birds uh, that live there. And those were ptarmigan. Uh, but nobody knew how to spell the word ptarmigan. If you're familiar with ptarmigan, everyone, of course, it has a silent P, uh, P-T-A-R-M-I-G-A-N, but nobody could spell ptarmigan, so they called it chicken instead. And that's actually a true story. So it is a very quirky, very fun place. And uh, that is on our drive en route from Dawson City, Yukon to Fairbanks, Alaska. I love Fairbanks, Alaska. <clears throat> I really do. Uh, it is the second largest city uh, in the state of Alaska after Anchorage, uh, of course. It is also the home to the University of Alaska as well, too, and has a population, um, a city proper, only of about 32 and a half thousand people. So much bigger metro uh, area. But uh, yeah, second largest city only has uh, 32 and a half thousand people there. But uh, it's also home to uh, Pioneer Park and home to the Alaska salmon bake as well and uh, the, uh, the the paddle wheeler cruise uh, that we take you on as well called the riverboat discovery but uh, uh, one of the other stops that we make it's actually um, it's probably about a 20 minute drive before we arrive in uh, in Fairbanks but at some point during our stay uh, we take you out to North Pole Alaska well naturally North Pole would be in Alaska and of course that is where Santa Claus house is and uh, I find for a lot of our folks doing this tour with us getting to North Pole is a really big deal. People are usually just chomping at the bit to get shopping uh, when they get there and, uh, you know, and buy some souvenirs from Santa Claus house. Uh, so that's it in the lower left hand corner. You can see the big sign outside, but uh, uh, grandparents, uh, one of the really fun things that you can do, and I know I love telling my two or guests this, is that you can actually make arrangements when you're at Santa Claus house to have a letter uh, sent from Santa all the way from North Pole <laughs> to your grandkids at Christmas time. So that's super fun. Uh, you can even purchase a postage stamp size piece of property uh, for a gift <laughs> for your grandkids from a uh, from North Pole, so really fun. There's so much to do in Fairbanks, and boy, we make the best of it. We uh, we really do. Uh, the paddle wheeler cruise uh, on the top uh, left hand uh, of your screen, uh, that is so much fun. It's called the Riverboat Discovery. Uh, Cindy, I won't touch on that just yet because I, I want to say I think you might have another slide coming up uh, with that. I think you do. Uh, we'll see. We'll go back if, if you don't. I just forget now. Um, in the center, everybody, though, uh, the Golden Heart Review, uh, we actually get to go out for live theater uh, during our stay. And it is, uh, it's really fun, you know, kind of goes through some of the, uh, the history of, uh, of Fairbanks. It's one of those places that had uh, kind of the notorious uh, antagonist, the, the local bad guy, and uh, the whole story about, uh, about what happened uh, there when, uh, when Fairbanks uh, was first founded. Uh, but fantastic uh, city tour that we get to enjoy, the evening show, the Golden Heart Review. And uh, I can't say enough about the uh, the salmon bake now. Uh, so uh, looking in uh, the top right hand corner of your screen, I just want to eat that right now, uh, looking at the picture. And let me tell you, everybody, those of you who like salmon, you're going to be in heaven uh, on this trip. Uh, it is just, it's just incredible. I almost don't have enough words for it but uh, uh, this is definitely one of the great places that you're going to have a chance to eat some scrumptious Alaska salmon this is an included meal and not to worry if you're not uh, not a fish lover that's okay there's options too like uh, like ribs as well so a beautiful meal there and then um, and then the riverboat discovery uh, Cindy I don't recall do we have their slide on that or should I we don't okay in that case I'm going to go ahead and talk about it right here so uh, top left hand corner of the screen everybody and actually even the bottom right hand corner of your screen uh, you're looking at uh, what's called China Indian Village on the bottom uh, right hand uh, corner that's actually a stop that we make uh, during our riverboat cruise uh, this it seems to me every time that I have done the riverboat discovery with Westworld groups and I've done it many times 
sometimes. It just seems to me like it's guaranteed fun. It is. Uh, it's about a three hour tour. We actually have a beautiful stew lunch, a, a nice beef stew lunch on shore uh, before we take off for our boat ride. And uh, the ride's about three hours. It's, uh, it's narrated, as I say, at one point we get off at uh, China Indian Village and we learn a lot about the local Indigenous culture. Uh, we learn in Alaska, they still say Eskimo. Uh, in Northern Canada, we say Inuit, but uh, we learn about the Eskimo people and the various uh, different, uh, you know, different groups of Eskimo people that live in Alaska. So we learn a lot about, uh, about their culture. And we learn so much uh, about Alaska and even just local Fairbanks culture on that riverboat cruise. Uh, in fact, uh, one thing that I don't believe we have a slide on, so I'm just going to go ahead and talk about it. Uh, we have a, a chance to see trail breaker kennels when we're on uh, the ship. Now, a neat thing about this is a lot of the things that we're seeing are things that are happening on the shores. Uh, so we're on two rivers that day, the China and Tanana uh, rivers. And uh, yeah, so we're actually standing on the ship. Uh, out there on those decks like you can see uh, in the top left hand corner uh, watching things uh, that are happening and uh, you know people who are narrating uh, with a PA system Trailbreaker Kennels uh, was the uh, kennel that belonged to one of the most famous dog mushers uh, that ever lived in fact uh, dog mushing is the state sport uh, for Alaska which I guess just makes sense uh, that musher's name was Susan Butcher and for about a decade she dominated uh, the sport of, uh, of dog mushing in Alaska. In fact, uh, one of the quotes in Alaska, uh, even to this day, uh, Susan's unfortunately not with us anymore, but the quote was, uh, Alaska, where men are men and women win the Iditarod. And uh, Susan won the uh, Iditarod four times. Sadly, she didn't live to be that old. She passed away in her 50s uh, of cancer back in 2006. But she lives on as one of the most famous dog mushers in Alaska's history. And her husband, Dave Monson and their family and their staff uh, still run Trailbreaker Kennels and you'll have a chance to uh, to see the dogs and uh, you know and watch them uh, you know pull in the cart it's, it's June of course so uh, but watch them pull in the cart and uh, yeah and um, you know it's not just stories about people that you're going to learn about on this tour uh, those of you who are animal lovers there's some great animal stories too uh, in fact uh, you'll see the statue that day of Granite. Uh, Granite was uh, her most famous uh, sled dog he was the leader that I if, if I remember correctly I think he actually was the leader on every one of the uh, the races that she won but he was actually a runt dog that uh, was never supposed to be a sled dog at all and uh, she decided that uh, she saw you know a, a spirit in him that she knew that he could be great at one time he during his adult life he almost died I think it was a heart virus came back from that won the Iditarod again and uh, there's actually a beautiful statue to granite so yeah there's some great animal stories that you're going to learn as well but uh, just uh, just so much I could I could tell you but that's just a little bit about our stay in uh, Fairbanks and uh, and then uh, we carry on um, towards uh, the beautiful city of Anchorage but on our way uh, the scenery between uh, Fairbanks and Anchorage uh, it's just it's beyond spectacular uh, again I just don't have enough words to tell you uh, what the scenery is is like uh, on this trip it just gets more and more beautiful for day after day after day uh, we will be taking what's called uh, the George Parks Highway uh, at this point now <clears throat> Uh, up to uh, Fairbanks, that's called the Richardson Highway, uh, after we left the Top of the World Highway, uh, and then later reconnect with the Alaska Highway. Uh, so you get to experience a lot of different highways on the trip, but uh, um, although the Alaska Highway ends officially at mile 1422 at Delta Junction, Alaska, unofficially, the highway, the Alaska Highway, continues on, also known as the Richardson Highway to Fairbanks. And then from Fairbanks to Anchorage, it's called the George Park. Parks Highway or the Parks Highway. Uh, and one of the incredible things that we pass, uh, pass by or pass through on this part of our journey is uh, Denali State Park. And the mountains are just, it's beyond stupendous. Now, without any question of all, uh, the most famous mountain in all of Alaska is a mountain that you're seeing on the left-hand side of your screen. It was known as Mount McKinley, but it has been returned to its true name, its proper name, uh, which is Denali and uh, Denali, uh, the high one. 
Uh, at one time, uh, the, uh, the park was known as Denali and the mountain was known as McKinley, but now officially it is Denali again, which is only appropriate really uh, because uh, the high one is a perfect name uh, for it. And it is, it is mind boggling. It is 20,310 feet tall. Uh, if you are lucky enough to see the mountain, you have joined what they call the 30% club. And when I think about the number of times I've seen the mountain and the number of times I've been to Alaska, I actually fall quite neatly right into the 30% club. So in other words, you have about a 30% chance of seeing Denali or the high one. It creates its own weather patterns and, uh, and when when you see it in all its glory, it is mind blowing and it makes all the other mountains around it look like little baby mountains. It's just stupendous. And if you join the 30% club, then you just have to buy all the merchandise. You have to buy the drink coaster and the t-shirt. And I know I have everything that says 30% club. It's, uh, it's so exciting, but it's, it's really hit and miss whether you get to actually see uh, the top of the mountain. Uh, and then looking over on uh, the right hand side of the screen, everybody, uh, you're looking at some of the stops that we make uh, in uh, beautiful Anchorage. Anchorage is a gorgeous city. Uh, it's a really interesting mixture of urban and, and wilderness. It really is. I mean, Anchorage is known for, you know, moose wandering right through people's yards uh, right in the city. And yet uh, it really is a, a gorgeous city with, you know, lovely restaurants and beautiful downtown core and shopping malls and, uh, and so on. But uh, uh, we're going to have a, um, a fantastic uh, city tour. I always love our city tour of Anchorage. Uh, you can see um, at the top of your screen on the right hand side, one of the stops that our local guides always take us to, uh, it's called Ship Creek. And it's a very, very popular spot uh, for, for sport fishing for the locals. One of the fun things the guides always like to tell us at some point in Alaska, usually in Anchorage, is how to remember the five types of salmon. Of course, every salmon has an alternate uh, name, but the five types the guides will tell you in Alaska, you simply use your hand. Chum salmon rhymes with thumb. Your, your pointer finger is sockeye. Uh, your middle finger, your big finger is your king. Uh, your next finger, I don't have any rings on tonight, but silver, silver salmon, and your little finger, pinky, uh, so pink. So chum, sockeye, king, silver, and pink. And it's a fun little story that uh, guides in Alaska like to tell you about, uh, about salmon. Uh, in the center of the screen on the right hand side, you're looking at a really beautiful shot of the skyline of uh, Anchorage. It sits between what's called Cook Inlet and the beautiful Chugach range of mountains. Uh, you're going to learn about, um, about Anchorage history as well too. Uh, they had an earthquake back in 1964 that registered 9.2 on the Richter scale and lasted for four and a half minutes. Uh, it's uh, still to this day I believe this fact is correct, the largest earthquake uh, ever to take place in the United States. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, 9.2 on the Richter scale. Uh, 131 fatalities, but many of those caused not from the earthquake itself, but from the resulting tsunami. But uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of history there, and uh, certainly you will learn all about that as well, too. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the bottom of the screen, uh, you're looking at a really fun place. We're seeing it from the outside. It's an aerial shot, Alaska Wildberry product. Uh, they specialize in uh, beautiful, uh, you know, uh, yummy delicacies. Mostly they focus on chocolates at Alaska Wildberry chocolates. Uh, a lot of their chocolates are jelly filled with the local wild berries. So that's that's one of my favorite places to shop on this tour, uh, along with uh, the salmon, the, the canned smoked salmon I always buy in Fairbanks too. But uh, uh, a fun thing they have at Alaska Wildberry berry products in Anchorage is that you can't call it a waterfall because it's actually made of chocolate. So I guess it's the world's largest chocolate fall. Uh, it's 20 feet tall and has 3000 pounds of chocolate <laughs> in it. So uh, that's a fun photo opportunity uh, as well at Alaska wild berry products. So. Thanks, Cindy. Now, for those of you who are doing the uh, all coach cruise or the uh, the all coach uh, tour, excuse me, uh, what I meant to say is you actually still have a one day cruise um, on uh, the all coach tour. 
And that is with Stan Stevens. Uh, so you're seeing on the top right hand corner of the screen, uh, the Stan Stevens ship uh, that we would take. Uh, but what happens uh, on this part of your itinerary, everybody, is uh, you will drive from Anchorage to Whittier, Alaska. And uh, <laughs> interesting thing on the lower left hand corner of your screen, you're looking at a huge apartment building, uh, such a strange thing in Whittier, Alaska, where all of the residents of the entire town about 1200 people live together in one giant apartment building just because uh, Cindy and I were discussing this earlier uh, so few places to build <coughs> uh, just you know nestled right into these towering mountains in fact Whittier named for the romantic poet uh, John Greenleaf Whittier just because of its dramatic beauty uh, so from Whittier you take the Stan Stevens ship across beautiful Prince William Sound to Valdez and there's Valdez on the top left hand corner uh, now, I haven't really talked about wildlife uh, yet on the trip, and that's something that we will do, but on the Stan Stephen uh, boat cruise, some of the things that you very likely will see, you have a very good chance of uh, seeing whales, orca, even humpback as well. Um, other things as well too, like stellar sea lions, um, puffins. I know I've seen puffins uh, on, uh, on the Stan Stevens uh, cruise in Prince William Sound. Um, other things too, uh, you know, bald eagles. And, uh, and not only that, um, you know, glacial ice and maybe even calving glaciers uh, as well. So you have a good chance of, uh, of seeing that on that cruise across Prince William Sound. Uh, so yeah, so uh, you're seeing Prince William Sound, which sits on the east side of the Kenai Peninsula. Uh, beautiful sunny view of it there in the lower part of your screen. And then have a look, everybody, on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, that is the entrance into the tunnel. Now, here's a crazy thing about getting to Whittier, Alaska to start our cruise. You have to go through a tunnel that goes through the mountain. Uh, years ago, what they used to do is they used to put vehicles, tour buses, everything on a flatbed on the train, and the train would take you through the mountain. Uh, nowadays, and more modern times, though, uh, uh, the highway traffic and the train traffic alternate on the half hour. Uh, and uh, so for half an hour intervals, either traffic or train travel goes through the mountain uh, to get from the Anchorage side to the uh, the Whittier side. So it's, it's pretty dramatic, uh, it is. And speaking of uh, dramatic, talking about Valdez, it is the snowiest place in the United States. And Valdez, Alaska averages 300 inches of snow annually. Nearby Thompson Pass averages between six and nine hundred inches of snow annually. It's just uh, it's just crazy. Um, I uh, I was just doing a little bit of uh, fact finding on that and uh, read an interesting fact that the snowplow drivers actually have beacons on them. So just in case their snowplows in the winter time get buried by the snow, they have a way to find the snowplow drivers. So yeah, fortunately that doesn't happen in the month of June. But I thought that was a really interesting uh, fact about. All these. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll try and uh, pick up my pace here a little bit, but uh, we're just looking here at some of the spectacular scenery um, around Valdez and Thompson Pass, uh, beautiful waterfalls. It's just, it's ridiculous how busy, how, how beautiful rather it, uh, it really is on this tour. And then uh, we go back down through Toke, Alaska. Uh, they call Toke uh, Main Street, Alaska, because when you're coming or going from the state, it's like the intersection. You really have no choice but to go through Toke, uh, uh, Alaska. So uh, we uh, we stop in Toke, Alaska, and then uh, and then carry on from there. Big city. Um, now on uh, on all of our itineraries, whichever of our itineraries that you are choosing, uh, the All Coach, the Coach and Cruise, or the Taste of Alaska, uh, you'll have a chance to visit Car Cross Yukon as well. And uh, this is where the remains of the SS Tushai are, the old paddle wheeler. Uh, some historical buildings there as well. Uh, these lovely buildings here uh, with the, um, you know, the, uh, the indigenous uh, fronts on them um, are the newer, kind of the newer part of Car Cross, but we'll have a chance to spend a bit of time there, uh, do some shopping. By the way, Car Cross uh, shortened for Caribou Crossing for the Caribou that would pass through, pass through here. 
So yeah, you can go ahead and turn the slides, Cindy. Thank you. Uh, but the interesting thing about that is uh, the day that we take the White Pass train, uh, we start in uh, Whitehorse, and then we uh, get on the train in uh, the, excuse me, so we start that morning in the Yukon, we get on the train in BC, Car Cross is still in the Yukon, uh, Fraser BC is the train station, you can see that in the top right hand corner of the screen, Fraser is actually in British Columbia, and then you need to take your passport that day because we're going to Alaska, uh, back to Alaska, and uh, this is uh, the beautiful White Pass train ride. You want to talk about dramatic scenery. This is some of the most dramatic scenery I've seen anywhere on all seven continents uh, that I've been very fortunate to travel on. There are places, there's one place that takes my breath away every single time where you go over a wooden trestle bridge and you, you come over that bridge and you look out and you realize you're looking about a thousand feet straight down into the valley below. So I, I know myself as a guide, I'm sure our other guides do this as well. We try and be very careful about telling our groups ahead of time what side of the train to sit on if you are afraid of heights. Because believe me, there's a side of the train you'll want to sit on so that you don't get those same dramatic views if you are afraid of heights. But it's a wooden, uh, or excuse me, it's a narrow gauge, pardon me, a narrow gauge railroad. So it's uh, it's three feet wide. Uh, they began construction in 1898 to create a safer route for those, um, <clears throat> excuse me, those gold miners uh, making their way over the very dangerous either Chilkoot Trail or White Pass. And so hence the construction of the White Pass Railroad. And that was completed back in 1900. Uh, today, it's only operated for tourism, uh, not for practical purposes anymore. But the scenery is unbelievable. And it's a narrated trip as well. So, so much history and just so much incredible beauty. Thanks, Cindy. Uh, what you're looking at here, everyone, now is uh, is Skagway. So I, uh, so those of you who will be, you know, do the cruise trip, you'll definitely spend more time in Skagway. But those of you who are looking at doing our uh, Yukon Alaska all coach trip, you will be taking the White Pass train into Skagway, and you'll have a chance to spend a little bit of time there as well. So uh, so much history in Skagway, uh, dramatic scenery, just incredible. And uh, similar in its, not just its architecture and its history, but similar in, um, yeah, in, in its buildings, really, uh, you know, speaking of architecture, uh, to uh, Dawson City, uh, the Golden North Hotel uh, in the top uh, right-hand corner. So some of these are original buildings uh, from, uh, from the gold rush as well, too. Uh, Skagway became a pretty rough town at one point at the height of the gold rush. There's a famous quote when they said at one time it was little better than hell on earth. That was a famous quote uh, about Skagway. So, but so much history. And this town very much had a famous bad guy uh, named Soapy Smith, who basically fleeced all the gold miners uh, of their gold pokes and, you know, ran the prostitution ring and, you know, all his henchmen and finally killed in a gun battle on the docks uh, in July of 1898. So it's quite, it's quite a story, but it's actually a true story and uh, the building on the left hand side unquestionably one of the most photographed or maybe it actually is the most photographed uh, building in all of the uh, beautiful state of Alaska called the Arctic Brotherhood Hall uh, you can see uh, the the date uh, 1899 just above the door but it has a very strange looking facade uh, today it's operated by the visitor center but uh, the man who <laughs> who uh, basically created this facade on the original Arctic Brotherhood Hall. I, I sometimes wonder if he just didn't have anything better to do or what his motive was, but uh, the story goes he collected approximately 8,800 driftwood sticks and nailed them all to the front of the building. So it certainly makes for an unusual looking building. And uh, yeah, some of the sticks are original. Some of them have been replaced uh, since that time in 1899, but uh, definitely one of the most photographed buildings without a doubt in all of Alaska. Hmm. 
And then uh, here uh, for the All Coach Tour, we uh, go back down uh, the Alaska Highway, stopping in Watson Lake, and uh, and then some fun things to do there. Uh, there's even a beautiful little nature trail uh, to do in Watson Lake. But something else really special that we have included for you uh, in our stay in Watson Lake, coming down uh, from uh, from Alaska and the Yukon, is the Northern Lights Center, and that's what you're looking at, everybody. Uh, actually, on the left hand side too, but a nice shot of the exterior of the building on the lower right hand side it only opened back in 1996 and uh, it is uh, basically a theater uh, showcasing the aurora borealis um, in a, a really beautiful state-of-the-art uh, theater with uh, panoramic video surround sound systems where you lay back in your big chair and you know and you watch the aurora and hear the narration and uh, it's it's really really cool so um, I love that we have that included in our itinerary uh, during our time uh, back in Watson Lake. Yeah, good. And then, uh, yeah, making our way back down the, um, uh, back to the highway, we do our, uh, our farewell dinner in, uh, in Fort St. John and then, uh, and then making our way back, uh, back south again. So, uh, and then quickly, everybody, I'll try and be uh, relatively brief, uh, but basically um, I just want to talk a little bit about now uh, the alternate. Uh, so yeah, so we have um, uh, the all coach with the one day cruise of Prince William Sound. We have the coach and cruise tour, and then we have the taste of Alaska. So as Cindy was saying earlier, the taste of Alaska, just a bit of a shortened version where you're doing basically everything that we talked about up to Anchorage. And then you can see the airplane on the right hand side of your screen from Anchorage. So you do all of that. And then from Anchorage, uh, you fly back back home again. So you're getting a, a shorter tour, but you're getting a ton of stuff uh, included uh, in that. And then you have the coach and cruise tour as well. So this is for people who kind of want a little bit of everything. Uh, you've done the land tour, but down, now you want to spend some time in Southeast Alaska on the cruise ship uh, as well too. And uh, yeah, so that's what we're looking at there uh, where we do, uh, you know, uh, the majority of what we talked about in uh, the previous slides. And then we get on our cruise ship uh, outside of, uh, of Anchorage. So yeah, thanks Cindy. So what we'll do everyone is uh, we'll make our way uh, from uh, Anchorage to uh, Seward, Alaska. And that is, I know I keep saying this, I sound like a broken record, but I cannot help it. The scenery is just dramatically beautiful. Um, yeah, I, I can't say enough about it. That drive, it's about a three hour drive from Anchorage to Seward, Alaska, which is where we board the cruise ship. Uh, our cruise, uh, we are scheduled again in 2024 to be on Radiance of the Seas. Uh, it's kind of a nice kind of mid-sized ship, I guess you'd say. Uh, total capacity on board around 2,500. Uh, I believe it's 961 feet long. There we go. Uh, the Radiance of the Seas. So yeah, uh, you know, the nice thing too is uh, uh, you know, for guests who choose this tour, what people like about this is that now um, you've kind of got the busiest part of the trip behind you, and now you can kick back and uh, and relax on the cruise ship, and uh, you know, put your things in drawers and uh, and have uh, a seven night uh, a seven night cruise through uh, through Southeast Alaska. Uh, one of our days on the cruise, uh, we actually do Hubbard Glacier. If you've ever heard the term White Thunder, um, I actually I know I mentioned that talking about Antarctica in last week's presentation, but it certainly applies to Alaska too. Uh, I've seen White Thunder and Prince William Sound on that one day Stan Stephen cruise that we talked about already. And I've certainly seen it from the cruise ship as well. Now from the cruise ship, it'll just depend on weather conditions, how close we can get to the glacier. Because remember, we're in a much bigger ship uh, on the water, uh, you know, on this trip than we are on that one day cruise in Prince William Sound. But it sounds like thunder. It really does. You hear the sound from first and then boom and then you see the calving of the glacier uh coming off but it sounds uh, you hear that cracking uh just like thunder so it's uh it's a really interesting term but uh, yeah good thanks cindy 
So, uh, so yeah, so Hubbard Glacier, and uh, and then we have four ports of call during our week at sea, uh, making our way through Southeast Alaska. This is the capital uh, of Alaska, everybody. This is Juneau. Uh, it's a beautiful city. It's it's certainly a very unique city, and it's a unique U.S. capital, the only U.S. capital that's not accessible by road. There's no road access actually uh, into Juneau. But um, uh, you're looking at the governor's mansion. Uh, so again, it's the capital, governor's mansion on the lower right hand corner of the screen. Um, in three of our four ports of call as Westworld guides, we offer you a complimentary walking tour. I actually love doing uh, the walking tour. So yeah, it's purely optional. Some of our, our guests will, you know, have you know booked various excursions off the cruise ship. But our complimentary walking tour is always uh, an option for you as well, too. So we'll go around by the governor's mansion. You'll see downtown Juneau like you're seeing in that lovely shot on the right hand corner of the screen there's a, a very famous uh, saloon you can go check out on your free time called the red dog uh, in uh, uh, in Juneau and then uh, talking about uh, you know animal lovers there's a beautiful story about Patsy Ann the deaf white bull terrier that for uh, more than a decade met every ship she sat in the dock she loves ships and sat in the dock waiting for every ship to come in and we'll stop by her statue and pay our respects to uh, the beautiful story of Patsy Ann that lived back in the 1930s and early 1940s. And then another fun thing you can opt to do on your own uh, during our time in Juneau on the cruise is the Mount Roberts Tramway. And that's what you're looking at on the left hand corner of the screen. It's not that expensive to go up the tram. And once you get up there, then a beautiful view and lots of things to look at and just incredible commanding views of the Gastineau Channel and uh, the city of Anchorage as well. Or excuse me, city of Juneau. Pardon me. Thanks, Cindy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then we also have a port of call in uh, Skagway. So those of you who have uh, done the all coach tour, you've had a chance to visit Skagway. Uh, those of you who might be opting to do the coach and cruise tour, uh, we usually spend a little less time in Skagway, uh, you know, when we go with the train, because we know we're going to have a full day in Skagway uh, on the cruise ships. So, uh, but we do, as I say, have a, um, you know, have a walking tour for anybody who wants to, uh, to join us. And uh, yeah, we talk more about Skagway's history, of which there is much. Some of it, you know, some some sordid tales, uh, for sure, uh, in uh, in Skagway's history. Some of those even uh, pertain to the famous Red Onion Saloon in the lower right hand corner of your screen. Uh, that was uh, probably one of the most famous, or maybe I should say, infamous brothels uh, in all of Alaska. But uh, even now, you kind of want to maybe look away. Some of the pictures on the wall are rather interesting. There's a lot of stories inside there but uh, nowadays you can go and sit and have a, a local brew and uh, and have a meal inside the red onion saloon but they actually still do brothel tours upstairs you can pay to do a brothel tour and uh, it's interesting I've done it so uh, yeah there's uh, you know purely for research purposes but uh, uh, but yeah it's <laughs> it's really interesting and uh, and again you're seeing some of the uh, the architecture like the golden north hotel uh, that's an interesting one with that dome and, and basically why that would have existed uh, for sailors and travelers who didn't speak English, they would recognize that gold dome as being an accommodation. So kind of like the way the, the candy cane stripe pole represented a barber shop, uh, you know, certain things that would represent uh, certain, certain places to people who, who didn't know the, the language. <clears throat> Um, and then Icy Strait Point, this is a port of call I love very, very much. Uh, so what you're looking at here is, uh, is just a waterfront. This is a much, much smaller port. Uh, here we actually do not do a walking tour because there's no town per se, but the scenery is just spectacular. So, and they've actually done a lot uh, in recent years uh, just to kind of increase uh, the, the tourism amenities. Uh, they've modernized it uh, for better or for worse, but they've definitely uh, spent a lot of money uh, modernizing the port at Icy Strait Point. But uh, to be totally honest, uh, in my personal opinion, this is the most beautiful of, uh, of all the ports of call we're at. And I think I love it too, because it is so much smaller than the other ports too. Thanks, Cindy. 
Yeah, you're really not going to see, you know, Diamonds International and, you know, all those places aren't going to exist here. But one thing I really love about this port of call is uh, if you like to walk at all, and it's a totally flat walk uh, on a really lovely boardwalk from Icy Strait Point along the waterfront to a native village called Huna. And uh, these are just photos uh, in Huna, uh, the orca there, just a statue along the walkway. And then, uh, yeah, just totem poles poles and just just eye candy it really is and the lower corner of the screen uh every time you walk into huna you know there's always going to be uh you know uh, someone carving totem poles there and uh it's just it's really special but it's about a, a you know, 20 maybe 25 minute walk and then you can opt if you wish to to catch the shuttle bus uh back from huna and just you know save save yourself uh some of the walking but uh, but really just a spectacular place and just such incredible scenery Yeah, um, I should mention too, uh, we talked a bit about some of the marine wildlife you could see, uh, but uh, you know, on the land tour as well, uh, you, you, almost for sure you'll see moose, uh, almost for sure you'll see black bears. Sometimes we get lucky and see grizzly bears. Um, yeah, almost for sure we'll see bison, uh, definitely bald eagles as well. Uh, but yeah, sometimes grizzly, uh, sometimes, um, you know, uh, doll sheep, uh, mountain sheep, uh, others known as stone sheep as well too. So just so much wildlife there really is. But, uh, um, and then one more port of call and that is Ketchikan. Uh, a lot of history here too. It's, it's such a fascinating looking town. You're seeing, um, uh, you know, the Totem Heritage Center there in the center of the screen. Uh, Creek Street on the lower left-hand side of the screen. Uh, definitely one of the most famous areas of Ketchikan. Uh, Cindy he has a great shot for us on the lower right hand side of the screen there was very little land to build on so they drove pilings into Tongas Narrows to create more space to build buildings on so much of Ketchikan even today uh, is basically not land it's just area that was uh, created uh, to put to put buildings on top of so Creek Street really shows you that so pretty pretty fascinating uh, architecture and uh, and and so much history as well. Great. And again, uh, Cindy just has a really great shot for us here of uh, the scenery. Uh, the last day of the cruise after we finished all of those ports of call is just cruising through the inside passage as we gradually make our way uh, back to Vancouver. So it's just, it's wild and it's spectacular. And, uh, you know, if you're lucky, you might get to see a humpback breaching, you know, just like that uh, on the cruise as well. But, uh, and even if you don't, it's just, again, I, I can't say enough about how, how absolutely spectacular uh, yes, the scenery is uh, is just amazing. So yeah, uh, thank you, Cindy. Yeah. All right, I think that covers. All right, it. <laughs> thanks so much, Coral. That was so interesting. Um, your love for Alaska comes through for sure. Yeah. Um, we're just going to get to everybody's questions here, and uh, I'm just going to have a quick look to see what we have. <laughs> And if you've um, got your questions, you know, now's a great time to put them in there. You can type them into the Q&A box. And um, if not, I can let you know that we will have um, an email coming out to everybody probably uh, before the end of the week here to give you some more information on the tour. It'll have probably a link to our um, recorded version of this presentation. So if you've got somebody you think might like to join you but wasn't able to watch the presentation that will all come out to you as well um let's see we've got any questions none coral you've done a, such a great job you've answered everybody's questions that's <laughs> awesome <laughs> but uh, one thing that we do get asked and i know coral will will attest to this is um you know Currency, obviously, you're going to take U.S. dollars on your journey, both Canadian and U.S. And uh, I don't know, Carl, what are other some common questions that maybe um, you get asked? Um, you know, I guess people probably ask about uh, kind of the, the typical, you know, clothing and, and weather related and, and, and that sort of thing, too. You know, in, insect repellent, what the bugs are going to be like and, uh, and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing probably some of the some of the most common common questions right and I'm, I'm assuming that in june the bugs are not too bad 
they're not no no they're really not oh, we no. usually there's a few places we might encounter them but uh but not mostly at picnics they they like picnics <laughs> oh, no different than at home <laughs> exactly yeah no different than at home well that is wonderful so I just want to say again, thank you, Coral, for, for joining us this evening and, and sharing your love of Alaska with everyone once again. And, uh, you know, thank you to everybody for joining us. And hopefully you can join us next week for our presentation on Iceland. And if you want any more information on this tour or any of our tours, you can email us at inquiries at westworldtours.com. Uh, you can follow us, send us a message on Facebook. Or you can contact your local travel agent. Um, they're they're very happy to answer any questions that you may have with regards to our tours. So enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. And uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Nice to be here with you tonight. Bye, Coral. <laughs> Bye, Cindy. Thank you. Thank you.